Hey everybody, Tom here with Hidden Beats, and today we are talking with Kelly Lee Evans. How are you doing today? I'm good, Tom. How are you doing? Pretty good. Um, so we're we're here to talk a bit about your music, your your award that you just uh, won. But can you give a little intro about yourself to new listeners slash viewers? Sure. I am a singer songwriter, mostly in the jazz soul. Vain. I'm Canadian, born and raised in Scarborough, but I live here in Ottawa. I don't even ask, where are you based? I'm actually in Ottawa myself. You're in Ottawa? Yeah. Okay. Where, what neighborhood? I'm <laughs> in uh, South Canada. Oh, okay. Yeah. Now I'm downtown. Okay. Yeah. Oh, that, I had no idea. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. um, so born and raised Scarborough, living here in Ottawa. I came to go to Carleton University and um, ended up just staying because I, I love the city. Yeah. It's a nice city for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah, music wise, most of my career has has actually been mainly in, in France, you know, like uh, jazz, jazz has a really big following in France. So uh, as much as like I, I love performing here at home, a lot of the shows happen to be in France till about 2013. I, I got hit by lightning and mm -hmm. yeah, and that kind of changed, changed things yeah, <laughs> for <I'd> me. So. <laughs> yeah. So how did you get into music in like your early life? Parents musical at all or just kind of oh, come man. across it? I my first my first uh solo was in kindergarten. Okay. Yeah, I totally loved singing right off the bat. And I always I loved everything artistic, creative. I, I draw, I sing, I paint, but my family was like 100 percent not into me being a singer, like mm. lawyer, doctor, engineer. <laughs> that's okay. It. That's it. Yeah. So, I mean, like, even growing up, I didn't take any art class. So the art uh, teacher just at lunch and like paint and I would try to join things up, like kind of just outside of school. But my parents considered taking like a music course or something like that, a waste of a credit. Mm, okay. Yeah. So, I mean, as much as like they loved music, they just thought that I should like focus on academics. Yeah. I'm an artistic guy myself and doing the arts. And my mom was kind of like, oh, you should do better in this. And I actually failed math every year in high school just because I hate it doing the work <laughs> yeah yeah right and math takes work you know mm -hmm. yeah I'm exactly. really good at it in my head but when I actually have to write it down oh that's just a whole nother story I don't want to do <laughs> but it's funny like we'll put in the work for it to like to create a piece you know and to mm -hmm. and to learn to learn like the music that we need but if you don't love it it's hard it's hard to push but at the same point like I really as much as I loved making music I really loved making my parents happy and so mm -hmm. I focused as much as I could on doing that. So I, you know, valedictorian, all around student, every like club, you know, as many things as I could do. And then when I came here to go to Carlton, in like back in the like late nine, like mid nineties, I um, I came to do like legal studies, but honestly, I was just like I pretty much felt like I was just hiding out, you know, mm -hmm. like because if you asked me what I was going to do afterwards, I couldn't really say, like, I just really wanted to sing, you know? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And, and I mean, you've definitely, you've been doing well with it. So. Well, but it wasn't, e it wasn't easy. Like my, um, so basically like, so I went to school, did the, did my first undergraduate. Well, I actually did two undergraduates at the same time, one in legal studies and one in English lit. Okay. So I was there like, you know, chugging away. And then after I graduated I had an opportunity to say like go to music like take music at Carlton or to take my master's in legal studies and legal philosophy. So I decided to take legal philosophy once again spurning music. Mm -hmm. And so while I was there like working on it, my mom called and said that she had been diagnosed with cancer. It was um this type of cancer called multiple myeloma. Okay. And she she died like six, six seven months later. Oh, wow. And yeah, and it was like that experience of like watching her go and also just going through my own like near death type experiences in that first couple of years after where I realized like just life is just too short to mm -hmm. to spend every to be unhappy you know what I mean to spend every day being unhappy not doing the thing that you love and so I dropped out of my master's and I had like one chapter left to write oh wow yeah and then I started to write music and um here comes my son. <laughs> so I started to I started to write music, and hold on, I'm just gonna tell him one second. Yeah, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, yeah. So 
refocus. Um, yeah, so I dropped out with one chapter left to write on the thesis and I started to write music and all the music that I wrote in that first little blip, which was really like nuts for me because I had never really like thought I could be a songwriter, but I went for it. And um, all that music became the first music, the first songs on my first album that was nominated for a Juno. So it was just like, it was kind of like that. I just jumped. You know what I mean? Like I just jumped. Yeah. Just took and the leap for it. Took the leap. And yeah, it's been it's been pretty amazing. Um, after that, I went and I came in second in a competition in the states called at the time it was called the Thel Thelonious Monk Institute of Jazz competition. Okay. And yeah, so it was at like the Kennedy Center and all these big artists in jazz were there, like you know Herbie Hancock, Wayne Shorter, Quincy Jones, Dee Dee, like people that are just like huge in that in that type of music, you know. And mm -hmm. uh, it was just such a like affirming experience to be around them to make music to be welcomed into the the enclave yeah. <laughs> and then yeah and then to make a go for it and so that's basically how my career started and that's how people got to know me and um and that's how I started to to get out there put out my own cd and like the rest is history whatever that means <laughs> but, <Yeah. laughs> but you know what it is like you just keep growing mm -hmm. just keep moving and I mean it's it's definitely working like I said and I read you open for like John Legend and Willie Nelson. How do you, yeah. how do you go between those two different types of artists to open for? Totally. Yeah. And especially like, I'm like, my music is not very close to either, you know I mean? It's maybe a bit, obviously closer to John Legend than to, mm -hmm. to Willie Nelson. But I mean, that's the nature of music festivals now, you know, like you're going to be, you're going to be paired up with like their music festivals right so you can yeah. be doing a jazz festival but it's a music festival and so that was that's what what it was it was i was at the ottawa jazz festival okay. and they were like kelly Lee, we want you to open for willie nelson and i was like uh okay and <laughs> it was it was amazing because we got there and so they set it up like um the vip section is first right so every yeah. like every willie nelson fan like possible is trying to get those tickets and they're all there and they're there mm -hmm. early you know and I just remember they were like, they had their band, their bandanas on and like, you know, the muscle, muscles, like all yeah. out and like the leather, leather vests and the whole, you know, they were, they were, Nelson. they were suited up, <laughs> they were yeah. suited up. And I was there and they, like at the beginning, they were just like arms crossed, like, okay, what she got to say. Right. Mm -hmm. And then like, after a while you see them start nodding you know their heads are going with the music and then afterwards it was like they're just they're just in it and that was like such a a beautiful feeling you know to just know that like music I mean like I grew up listening to Willie Nelson I grew up listening to Barbara Mandrell and like to to mm -hmm. you know so to me it's not a it's not a stretch to put me there you know like but I can see why somebody outside might look and be like okay what she got to say and so I think if you love music um and you're open, you know, you can, you can enjoy pretty much anything, you know, you can find, you can find something to love in anything. Oh, for sure. Like I'm a huge music fan of any genre. If it's a good piece or a good track. Yeah. I, that's what I like. I don't yeah. care if it's, you know, classical, like one of my favorite uh, pieces is, I think it's John Williams composed the feather theme from Forrest Gump. Now I'm going to have to look it up. It's it's such a nice delicate piece, but then I also like like ACDC Highway to Hell, and I can go for anywhere in between. The feather theme on Forrest Gump's soundtrack, amazing piece for sure. Well, it was basically Forrest Gump was one of the 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 VHSs. I'm I am i do not even care to date myself. I'm 48. <laughs> I'm thankful to still be here. They had one of the VHSs I had like you know back in the day um, when you don't have like cable. Yeah. And so you have like 10 VHSs, and basically. Like this is pre-internet. Rotate here. through and yeah, <laughs> and so yeah. And so I'm sure as soon as I hear it, I'm gonna be like, oh, that song. But John Williams is like a beast. Yeah, he's he's a magical person. So like, yeah. I I understand the idea of the you know pieces from any which way that can hit you just that little extra bit. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, like that's that's kind of the way I've always approached it. Like, there's been. I've had a few times where people are like, well, how's that, how's that going to be, you know? And I mean, I don't know if you know George Benson. Yeah. Yeah. So I he, I opened for him and that was, I think, the, the, the most fun experience because 
Um, the guitar player that I was playing with at the time, a guy named Dave Thompson, back when he was young, he had gone to a, a pawn shop and bought a, a old, I think it was like a GB10. So it's one of, okay. it's like a, a Gibson, like it's a guitar that was one of his prototypes and not very many of them were made. Mm -hmm. And so he'd had it like all his life. And so we were there doing, you know, like I, people probably don't know, but like when you open for an artist, do you sound check after them? So he had just finished his sound check and then he like we were out there doing our thing and his guitar tech was like oh my god like that guy stole george benson's guitar so he starts like getting ready to run out on stage <laughs> right right and then he realized as he got closer that it wasn't the same because he had changed something in the i think in the in the brit something had been changed on it okay. and so he could tell that actually it wasn't george benson's guitar and then like all out of the blue we hear somebody say how much do you want for that guitar and it's george <laughs> benson Wow. And he's and he's on stage with us and he's like signing the guitar and because my guitarist was like, no, <laughs> I'm not going to give it up. Mm -hmm. But um, it was just like that. I think a lot of opening acts for bigger artists will tell you that that's kind of rare, you know, that they will take that moment and take time with you. Like Tony Bennett did the same thing, you know, like really a kind soul. Um, there are so many great people out there and mm -hmm. it's not often who you think it's going to be and like I mean he was George Benson was so nice like he invited I was doing like a a little bit later I did a tribute to Nina Simone and okay. it came out at the same time as an album I did called The Good Girl and I, I did this crazy thing where I put them out at the exact same time and so like I would do these shows and I'm like well I, like they both kind of took off you know at the same time so I was like what do I do like they're kind of different and he was like, oh, I do that. I have like a Nat King Cole show and then I do my own music. And he's like, why don't you come to see me do it in Montreal? And you can see how you could like incorporate that into your show. Mm -hmm. And I mean, like, why would he do that? You know, it was it was just so kind. And so like I was able to to get that guidance. And I mean, the same thing has happened like throughout my career where people who are ahead have looked back and said, hey, try this. Hey, you you might love this or hey can I can I can I help out in some way and I don't think I would be here if it wasn't for them yeah tidbits of wisdom are always nice when you're getting it from someone a little bit more seasoned or just experiences that they've had for sure yeah and these were all kind tidbits because you can get the unkind ones yeah, yeah. <laughs> right that's for but sure. these are these people were super kind and nice yeah I felt blessed yeah and I mean, so, and you, and you put together good songs. Like I actually listened to your lose yourself before. Oh, today. that's so that's the one the, when I was doing that tune, that's okay. the one where the Willie Nelson fans were like, yes. Well, that's it. And I listened, I'm like, okay, like, okay. Yeah. You, you, you put your, your soul into that for sure. And Thanks. I started listening to some of the tracks and I'm like, okay. Cause you, your music is new to me. I haven't heard it before. So when I got this interview, I said, uh, why not? And started doing my research and I was like, okay, this is, this is nice. I like this. Oh, I appreciate it. Thanks very mm -hmm. much. Yeah. Like I said, like if you give something time, like you can find something to love, you know, in just about anything and in anyone. Mm -hmm. And one of the big things we're here talking about today too, is you just got the, the award for the, the Her Music Award with the SoCan Foundation. Yeah. How, how has that been? Like, how's that experience been? You know, I have to say like, it's been just like, so so remember, I said, like, I'm dating myself. I said, I'm 48. Like, for me, looking at that award, I'm, I looked at the previous recipients and I was like, well, are they going to give it to somebody who's like mid-career? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. somebody who's further along, somebody who's older. Like, I don't consider myself to be like one of the cool kids, you know, like my music is 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 fun, but I'm making it for me and for people who like this kind of music, you know, mm -hmm. and um. And so I really didn't expect to be recognized, you know, and so, and also on top of that, I've had a lot of health issues in the last few years, like since the lightning strike and, and uh, just like after that, I like I had some head injuries. And so I haven't been out there like pounding the road, you know, mm -hmm. and so it's easy to think that you could lose your relevance, you know, if you're not out there making music in the way that like music to like touring like the music industry way of making music yeah. and um to know that to receive that recognition definitely felt very affirming and I mean like a lot of the reason like the, the award is tied to being continuing to be creative 
And so like the, the award money that I was able to receive will pay for like pay for a new computer, you know what I mean? And, and pay for an upgrade in my recording software and recording mm -hmm. my recording equipment, excuse me. And so like, that's just like, that's that keep going, you know, which I think we all need somebody to just keep pushing us forward. And then the other thing is, it's like, it's a songwriting award. And like I told you, like when I started out, I was like, how can I be, can you be a songwriter if you started writing in your twenties? You know, like if you haven't been doing this forever, you know, like if mm -hmm. you're not like some savant, some prodigy, could you be a songwriter? And so to be recognized from the song, a songwriting association and by my peers in that realm, that means a lot to me. Mm -hmm. And and how important do you think an award like this is for females in the music industry? It's it's a female centric award. So, yeah, well, I mean, like awards that have money. Come on. Like, number. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> right. So and it's not like a, it's like it's it's a it's a good chunk where you can do something with. And I, I don't there's I don't care what anybody says, like, you know, unless you're really at the upper echelon of this business, every little I'm sure even when you're at the upper echelon, every little bit helps, you know? Mm -hmm. So there's that aspect, but also like, I guess I don't, you probably weren't able to come to the, the ceremony, but that room was amazing. It was filled with mu musicians, like peers, like at all levels of my career, you know, like people who I've seen working at the different record labels who maybe moved on into other areas, you know, and, and people like that, you know, I used to, brush shoulders with at CMW when I first started out going every year, you know, trying to meet as many people as I could. Like the the Karen Bliss, who was like a journalist um, who I met early on, like she wrote my first bio. She was there, you know, to see Denise Donlin, but then also to see like the young, the young and up and coming um, women that have like been awarded already or who are just in that circle. It felt really, it felt so good to be a part of the community because like you, we're in Ottawa, you mm -hmm. know, and I've done my best to like get go back and forth from Toronto as much as I can to keep, you know, as close in the community as I can. But it, there's something there. You know what I mean? Like you, you can start to feel a little bit on the outskirts when you're in Ottawa. Well, Ottawa, the music community here is as great as it is it gets bypassed by a lot of the bigger stuff too so yeah you get overlooked by things like tours and all that so you don't get that opportunity to to showcase yourself as well as you would in Toronto exactly exactly so that was also great too you know so to to see them like recognize an older artist to recognize an artist that's not like they don't like how you could say you didn't really know me that well like they also you know maybe some of them hadn't really known very much about me either and so it just it spoke to their to their openness you know and to their being op willing to listen to something new for some of them you know and that's huge because like I think you of all people probably get tons tons and tons of content you know mm -hmm. and it can probably feel overwhelming, you know, of like to how are you, how are you going to listen to everything? How are you going to like be up on everything? And so when people are still open to new things, it's, I think it's pretty cool. Yeah. I have to, my team actually. So I hidden beats, I think we have like something like 17 photographers on the team. So across North America and they send me stuff all the time. Like I'm, I'm 39 this year. So I'm at a, a point where I'm really in tune with the, the old school stuff. And not as much of the new school stuff yet. I so got you. Yeah, they're they're younger and they're sending me all these things. And I said, I have I have no idea who that person is, or like you got to give me some sort of heads up of what's going on. And they're like, oh, we want to cover this show. And I said, sure, just just tell yeah. me tell me when it's done because okay. I don't know what to do with it. <laughs> you know, yeah. And the younger folks are listening to us, being like, that'll never be me. That's gonna be you. Yeah. Oh yeah, hundred <laughs> percent. It's gonna be you. There's just only so much information we can fit. You know. And I love hearing new musicians and getting new music. It's just trying to absorb it all. And, you know, am I going to put it in this playlist so I can listen to it regularly? Or is it just something that's I appreciate and, and it's there? So yeah, I hear Definitely you. hard sometimes. I hear you. Yeah. So one of the things I, when I was reading up more about you is that you, you're in care and music and trying to get themselves back into swing of things. Hey, Tom, sorry. I totally missed like 
10 seconds of what you said. Sorry about oh, that. Okay. So oh, yeah, it said good. one of the things and then it cut out. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what was the thing? Well, so I was asking, uh, you talk about on your Instagram profile, for instance, you're labeled as someone who talks about self-care and yeah. kind of keeping, keeping everything upbeat and whatnot. Do you have advice for people now that kind of COVID is on the downswing and we're getting back out in the world and, you know, we got music coming out. Do you have advice for people on self-care for you have used? Yeah. I mean, like I, I had to figure out self-care like way like early on because so like I was saying just for a little context for people that don't know my story like in so in 2013 I was hit by lightning in my house I I used to live out in Ashton which you may know and um that totally like rocked my world you know changed my life forever been about five months in a wheelchair 15 I fainted and hit my head and ended up spending like about two years in like recovering you know a lot of time spent in this room in this bed And, um, so I had to really figure out like how, like, that was my own little mini pandemic, you know, like I had to figure out like what to do. Cause I mean, in the beginning, like just even trying to get to the bathroom, I was crawling on the ground, uh, because the vertigo was just so strong and was hard for me to keep my balance and stuff. So, you know, I, I, I created this thing called my happy list, which is, is like, uh, it was all the things that keep me up you know all the things that make me happy and it's funny like I get to part of my job I sing but I also go and I speak to organizations and I talk to them about self-care and I get people to make their own happy lists and so like if I had a tip for people that would be like something that we would do we would just like break out your phone like it was something that for me like I started putting in just in my in my notes app you know on my phone and I wrote down stuff that like made me feel good like taking a a bath with bubbles you know um having tea uh meditating yin yoga um reaching out keeping in contact with a friend um could be like you know right now my my mobility is a bit down but it might be going out for a walk uh sitting out on the porch listening to the birds like whatever that thing is like just make the list you know and the cool thing about having a list is it's like a working document it stays on your like it can it's something that you can look at when you're struggling you know but i prefer to think of it instead of looking at as some like a like a prescription you take like after the crisis you know for me it has worked best by incorporating that all of that stuff into my day to begin with so it's my it's my putting my life jacket or my my oxygen vest on first you know so I tend to do a lot of those things like before I even see anybody else so you know when I wake up in the morning I meditate and when I say I meditate like five minutes maybe you know, like sometimes I may, it might even be three minutes. Like I'm, <laughs> I'm not a meditating queen, but it's taking that moment for myself. Um, I do my yoga in bed, you know, like I'm, <laughs> I, um, I med- I, like I, I journal every day, I write lists of gratitude that all, all that stuff gets done in the morning. Um, just praying and, and kind of just listening for my inner voice. And, um, and then to me, I need to stay out of isolation. You know, that's when I find like, that's, not a good thing for me so I need to be constantly keeping in contact so I have like you know note like a thing in my phone like I schedule time to like reach out to somebody you know and it could be at any point in the day but reach out get a make a phone call find a you know just find your people you know and by doing those things regularly and making them a part of my daily schedule they're what's keeping me here you know, like yeah. that's what, that's why I'm still here. <laughs> I need to do something like that. I work from home. So I literally sit in my little box here all day long. Um, You know, I have a new baby that keeps me busy sometimes, but other than that, it's here all day. Then sit in the baby and edit some stuff or come back in here and edit more things or whatever. And I roll out of bed grumbly and just come sit on the computer and that's, that's it yeah. for me all day. So something like that might be useful for me. You know, and it's like, you don't even have to like, it doesn't have to be big, right? Like even just picking like, what are a few things every day that you could feel good about doing? And then just like, line those, line those things up. Like you're good at, you, you didn't have any problem being on the call, like for right, right on time. And you kept that appointment. So it's Mm -hmm. like, and then keeping these appointments to yourself, because that's what builds you up so that you can still be here. (laughs) Yeah. Because I have three kids and I, (laughs) you want to still be here. Yeah. You know? Organization and stuff like that is, is the only reason I'm still here right now. Like yeah. being able to do things, just trying to keep myself 
and I don't even think I'm organized to be complete. My, my office is a nightmare back here and I definitely could be better organized, but the little bit that I have keeps me going. That's all. I, yeah. I think for me, it's like, it's just, it's bits. Right. And then, and you can keep adding on to that, but like, yeah, I've, it's always the worst for me is when I feel like I got to do everything now, you know, it's got to be perfect now. Like mm -hmm. that's where, that's where I really struggle. Like if, if I can just kind of do, a, like, I call myself an incrementalist. <laughs> yeah, I like that. That's a good one. Yeah. Yeah, I can just like see that a little bit better, <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know? Yeah. So I do have, I like to ask, especially for the first time, in, um, it's kind of a more insight as to who you are and get a little bit of deeper into your, into your way of thinking. First one I have is what's something to go to playlist that people wouldn't expect that you're listening to. Oh, man. <laughs> I'm going to tell you something. I don't listen to a lot of music. Okay. Yeah. And what I'm listening to tends to be, I, I'm a language learner. And so if, right, if I'm taking time to listen to anything right now, like, honestly, like there's a talent, like Harry Potter in Italian on my phone. That's, I mean, that's interesting though. Yeah. But that's the truth. Right. So like, so I'm listening to the first Harry Potter in Italian. I'm inaudible. Okay. Yeah. That's what people wouldn't, I think, expect. <laughs> That's, that's I, I wouldn't expect that for sure, but that actually is an interesting thought of it's a good way to kind of expand your mind on different things for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I love learning languages. Hmm, okay. I might actually do something like that myself now. <laughs> uh, next one I have is this one I, I always find interesting is what's one thing that should be asked in interviews that's not asked enough? Oh, man. And this could be about yourself or about interviews that maybe you've, you've watched and maybe, oh, he should have asked this or, you know, something that oh, you that's think should be asked more. Yeah, no, you know, I think, um, I think it's just, it, this just popped, like it's never popped into my head to think like somebody should ask me this, but I think I'm particularly interested in like the effect that our families have on us, you know what I mean? And, and like, and who we are today. So maybe some, like, maybe something like, you know, what, you know, like what, how to explain it? Like, what are the best things that you think you took from your parents? <laughs> what are the worst things? Or do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like what, because like, there's, there's some good, there's a lot of good, like for some of us, like who have like, maybe like more challenging relationships with parents, you know, like there's, we may think that, that we didn't get anything good, you know, or maybe we think that it's like, you're always trying to like be the opposite of your parents, but then maybe there's like, so yeah, what lesson, what lesson do you take from your parents into, or like, you know, into life or something like that? I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> good one too, though. I mean, yeah. I, I look at that, like, I don't, I don't have a relationship with my dad, but there's what, what did I learn from him and what, what yeah. I did? So that, no, that's a good one. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. And if I were to answer that question, like, like for my mom, I think I definitely like the good thing that I took from my mom was that like, she like, she was always like pretty positive. She loved people, you know? And so I feel like I took that and that I'm really thankful for that. And then for my dad, like, um, there's something like about like being like, I'm pretty rational. Do you know what I mean? And okay. I feel like I got a lot of that from him too. Like, I'm a, I feel like I'm a mix of my parents in that way where I can be very passionate, but also very rational. <laughs> no, not sure. It cut out a bit. <laughs> Sorry, what were you saying? I said that a great mix to have. For great mix. Parents. Yeah. Just seem to be having some issues. Oh, we got one last question for you here. This is important. Is why why do you keep music? At this point? I know I started kind of getting to it, but keep up with it. Why do I keep up with music? Yeah. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So like last June, oh, sorry, last July, I I thought I was going to need to uh, retire. You know, my my body was breaking down and I really wasn't doing well. Like, like all my shows in the fall and into like up to December. So I took off five months. And when I took off those five months, the last show that I did was well, one of the last shows that I did, I think was at Montreal jazz festival. So like big C, I don't know how many tens of thousands of people. And um, just to say like, yeah, like, I don't know if I'm thinking that I would feel strong enough to do them. And, you know, going back, to that moment of getting back on stage and like performing for people was just it's it's it was just like coming home you know what I mean like it's it's coming home and it's what made me realize like maybe music doesn't have to look like it looks for like maybe I'm not going to be that person with 200 tour dates you know and maybe that 
And I guarantee that that's not good for me or my body, you know, and it probably wouldn't be good for my family either. But I feel like I still have something to give, you know, and I get to do, so I've done a few shows since then. And I just savor each moment now because I really don't know. Like you really like watching my mom go, you know, she was, she was, uh, 56, 57, you know, she didn't, she like, that's not too far from where I'm going to be, you know, like maybe 10 years from now. Um, you don't know when you're going to go. So I just feel like I just want to savor every moment that I do have to perform because it feels like, it feels like the best parts of me, you know? Yeah, for sure. And you know, it's, it's what you do. It's who you are. So do it as long as you can. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. As long as it's still healthy for me, you know, like that's been another thing to, for it to be healthy. Yeah, like, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that's a, that's a pretty good way we can leave off and it's a good kind of a, a way for people to look at. And if it's something that you love and it's who you are, then do your best until you can't do it no more. Yeah. Pretty, pretty good moniker, I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But this, this was a, a delightful and I'm sure we'll get to do this again at some point. I mean, we are in Ottawa together, so there's always an opportunity. For sure. For sure. Yeah. Keep, keep me posted and please reach out. And if ever you're, you've got a show coming up and you want to come out and cover it, I, I, I'm a photographer also. So I come out, take pictures, we do reviews and everything. No way. Well, actually I do. I have, I should tell people. Um, so if you're out in Toronto on May 13th, I'll be at Kerner Hall. Okay. And remember I was telling you about that album, Nina, yeah. it was a tribute to Nina Simone. It won the Juno back in 2011, I think. So I'll be bringing back part of the original band to do that at Kerner Hall. And then we're coming to the NAC on the 14th. So Mother's Day, and we'll do that show there. So I'm super excited about that. So it's called The Rebirth of Nina. And mm -hmm. so May 13th at Kerner Hall in Toronto and May 14th at the National Arts Center here in Ottawa. All right, I'll definitely make sure to link that in, in the description of the video too so we can get some more some more eyes on it. Thank you. All right, well, we'll sign up. You enjoy the rest of your day and I got to go pick up a little one now and play with her for a bit. Nice. Now that's that could be on your happy list. That That is my happy list pretty much right now. Just yeah. when she wakes up and I get that smile, that's all I need for the day. It's it's the good stuff. Yeah, exactly. it's the good stuff. Oh. Uh, <laughs> Take good care, Tom. It was really nice to meet you. Yeah, you too. And I'm sure we'll connect more. For sure. For sure. Yeah. And reach out if you do want to cover that show. Yeah, I'll I'll send you a message or something. Okay, cool. Take care. All right. Bye. Bye.